Hello, good evening everyone and welcome. My name is Molly Silberberg and I work here at BAM in our Humanities Department where I organize our literary programming. Thank you all so much for being here tonight. Uh, tonight's discussion is part of Unbound, a book launch series that we proudly present in partnership with Greenlight Bookstore, our local independent bookstore and BAM's official bookseller. Through this series, we bring renowned authors, artists, and public figures to Brooklyn for the national launch of their latest works. This evening closes out an incredible year in which we've hosted events with Masha Gessen, Alice Waters, Dan Rather, Dave Eggers and Mokhtar Akanshali, Patrice Cullors and Asha Bandele, and Leslie Jameson. And tonight, we are honored to be hosting Darnell and this incredible Ooh. gathering. <laughs> yeah. We're so honored to be hosting Darnell Moore and this incredible gathering of interdisciplinary writers, artists, and cultural critics for the launch of his powerful memoir, No Ashes in the Fire, Coming of Age, Black and Free in America. The book is published by Nation Books, a leading voice in American independent publishing. This year, we've had the great fortune to work with Darnell on our Real <laughs> Impact series, where he has proven time and again his profound ability to engage a wide variety of perspectives in dialogue and to build community around some of the most pressing issues that face us as a society today. We're thrilled to be able to celebrate Darnell this evening and to create space for him and others to reflect on his story. To borrow the words of Kiese Limon, who unfortunately isn't able to join us this evening, Darnell Moore is doing something that we've never seen in American literature. He's not just texturing a life, a place, and a movement while all three are in flux. Darnell is memorializing a reckoning with a life, place, and movement that are targeted by the worst parts of our nation. He never loses sight of the importance of love, honesty, and organization on, on his journey. We need this book more than ever or as much as we've needed any book this century. Before I go any further, I want to acknowledge and express our deep gratitude to the Nathan Cummings Foundation and to the Critical Minded Initiative, which supports cultural critics of color. Their support has enabled us to bring all of these amazing voices together in a free event this evening. Please do give it up for them, because they're, the work they're doing is incredible. I'd also like to thank our two ASL interpreters, Howard Hines and Kathleen Taylor, for communicating this evening. And just a few logistical notes before I turn over the stage. First, please do take a moment to silence your cell phones. There's no flash photography or recording during this evening. Um, at the end of the evening, there will be time for questions and conversations, so I encourage you to think about it, and we want you to participate as well. Um, copies of No Ashes in the Fire will be available through Greenlight for a special 15% discount tonight only. Darnell will be signing and personalizing copies downstairs in the lower lobby immediately following the program, and there will also be pre-signed copies available as well. Um, in the interest of leaving as much time as possible for the program, I'll let you refer to your, the, your programs for all of the biographical information of our really esteemed guests this evening. So we've got a full evening in store for you, and to, talk, to start things <laughs> off, please welcome the incredible Brooklyn-based dancer and choreographer Dayon Sass, who will perform a solo to original music from Guthrie P. Ramsey, Jr.
found the chapter entitled Ripples. There were many nights I tried to skip bath time during my childhood. Even in my seven-year-old body, smelt like outside, as my mom would say. I would leap into my bed without worry, smelling like a mix of grass, hot air, sweat, grime, and good times. The bathtub in our small two-bedroom apartment felt too confining. And the way the water became sludge after I washed away the residue on my body left from hours of play repulsed me. I would move to the farthest end of any corner in the tub to avoid being touched by the once fresh water made dirty after washing. At some point, though, my dad decided he had had enough of my resistance. My dad loved the water. He swam with the grace of a bottlenose dolphin. When he went fishing, there was something about him that seemed to attract fish every time he released his pole. His brothers and sisters would tell me later that water was the element in which my father felt most disarmed and whole. One evening after dinner, my father called me into the bathroom. As I walked closer, I could hear the water hitting the bathtub floor with force. The door was slightly ajar as he stood in the tub, lathering a washcloth with ivory soap. Open the door. What you standing at for, he asked. I walked into the bathroom with as much annoyance as I did whenever I needed to wash. I'm about to teach you how to wash yourself properly. You can't be walking around here stinking. You're getting older, and your body is changing, he said. And he prepared the wash rag and soap as if he were about to begin a legitimate class on proper cleanliness. I stepped cautiously into the steamy bath water. It was the first time I stood in the presence of my father when he was naked. Which, was, which actually made me forget about how much I hated washing. It was mystifying to stand in the bathtub bare before the man who often veiled his deepest emotions and used the, physical power, used the force of his physical power to dominate the space he moved through. I stared at him as he stood uncovered, more vulnerable and more self-possessed than I had ever seen him. He was 23 years old at the time, younger than I am now, but he was a father who was raising children. I can barely care for myself at 41, 42. <laughs> Employed and relatively well paid and cannot imagine all the tools he needed and lacked to properly care for my siblings and me. Get all the way in the water. Stop being scared. You gotta learn to clean your whole body, especially behind your ears and under your balls. <laughs> he instructed me firmly but with care and amusement as we squeezed our bodies into the tub. When we sat down, he moved his hand over mine. Together, we grabbed the soapy wash rag and moved it across my neck, behind my ears, along my arms, and across my chest. My father gently washed my back as he instructed me on how to best clean the parts that smell the worst when boys play outside all day. My fear of the bath dissipated more and more after each repetition of calm instruction offered amid safety in the presence of my father, who, in other instances, used the same hands to do damage. There was a lesson to be learned in the water. Bathing correctly was one lesson, but I also learned how tenderness and violence, care and harm are strange bedfellows. They can coexist and are complex web of human connection, the bad always counseling out the good, and to the good that we are able to express smudges away the traces of evil, even the best of us are prone to meet out. Looking back, I no longer see a young black father who was the totality of recklessness and lovelessness. I see a human being, a young black man struggling to transform what he otherwise used as weapons into instruments of care, his hands. His strong and soft hands were the source of contradiction in my youthful mind. His hands, his human and fragile hands used gently and violently now symbolize the complexity I too carry within and negotiate as an adult. In the water, we received instruction. I buried a man who was stuck. He was forever attempting to break away from the world of the black boy who didn't finish grade eight, the one who had a kid at 15, a boy who was poured in by the lore of the streets, a teen who would later beat the girl he got beat up for protecting, a black man frozen in time. 
He was a black man who swung back when love sometimes showed up in the form of an embrace. We are the same. Like my father and so many other black men, some of us don't really ask for what we want because to ask for love is to ask for what has been denied us for so long. How many of us what, want what we have been told we cannot or are not allowed to have? Interpersonal and structural forces shape the ways we give and receive love as well as the violence we men sometimes inflict upon our partners. I am not sure if that was his struggle. I know it is mine largely because of his absence, which is a truth I believe had weighed him down. The last words I spoke over his unconscious body as he rested on a hospital bed, surrounded by the kids he had left long before were simple. Fly, I know you are heavy. We forgive you. Whatever weights you have been carrying, let them go. Fly. I only told him what I learned to do in his absence. Thank you. Just thank you. Um, this book is majestic uh, and heart wrenching and funny um, and so vulnerable. So thank you. Um, you read from one of the parts that I want to ask you about this this complicated relationship. Uh, you and I have both written about our complicated relationship with our fathers. Yeah. The the thing I admire is that even though you saw your father use his hands as weapons, you also so lovingly treated him and his life in this text. Before you started writing, d did the process of writing this change the way that you thought about who your father was and how he ought to be treated and, and, and the way you told his story? Yeah, I, um, my father passed uh, right when I started writing the book. And I, I said, um, had he had he still been alive, I would have wrote him as a as a totally different character in a book. Um, I would have wrote him without the loving complexity that he deserved. Um, you know, you know, to be to be quite to be real, like I, I didn't like him for a long time, and I, I'll probably say I, I I use the word hate at some point. Mm -hmm. um, until I was writing, and I was like, wait a minute, this. He had me at 15 years old. Like it never occurred to me that he was a black boy who had a black boy. Yeah. Um, and to my mother's credit, who is sitting here as well, um, I remember asking her like, how do you, like, you know, how do you feel about this? Like, you know, he kind of got on my nerves. Like, what's good with you? Like, why are you, you right. know? And she was like, um, you know, at some points in, in her life, he had been a hero for her. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, if my mom can figure out a way to sort of see him beyond just the sort of monolithic caricature as a monster and see him as a full human that did good and bad, so can I. Um, and I, 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 I can be honest and say that I carried that weight of anger for a long time and it was a heavy burden. So, and as much as I read that, the last part where I told him to let go of his weight, that forgiveness on my end was also released some from me too. Mm -hmm. And I was a totally different person by the end of that book. It like made me think to completely different about retribution, punishment, um, about transformative justice, about radical love. And it also made me really look at myself. Um, because I'm like, you know, for so long I lifted him up as a monster and as long as I wasn't him, I was, I was good. <laughs> Until I sat down and realized that I am, like I say in the book, an ellipses. Yeah. I'm his child. You, you know, you, you're tracking right where I want to go. I, I want to think about I, I was, I was. <laughs> we, we, we on the same <laughs> path. Um, you say that at, at some point in the book, you say that you were thinking a lot about the relationships you had with young women in college, your homegirls. Um, folks that you engaged in sexual exploration with. Lord, my family's in the room, Lord. <laughs> Boy, you don't publish the whole book. You don't publish the whole book. <laughs> it's all right now. <laughs> I, I see you. 
I'm sorry, Mama. I, I apologize. <laughs> but blame your baby. Okay. So, <laughs> so, but but young women that helped you do critical emotional labor. Yes. And the, y'all heard her words, right? <laughs> and the way that you, and so I'm. I was very interested, both in. I think you do hold yourself accountable, but I also hope in writing this that you that you do give yourself some credit, some tenderness, mm. some gentleness, um, in the same way that those young women would invite you into a conversation. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like, in, in writing about them and attesting to that labor, do you feel like it has transformed how you relate to women now? Are there lessons that you've learned that you feel like matter for young men thinking about this? Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's, it, to, you know, it was, it took a lot of courage to, it takes a lot of courage once to sort of write one's life on a page and you're, abs you're writing other people's lives on a page too. That's right. It takes even more courage, I think, in a memoir, which can feel often narcissistic and grandiose and like, it can, the memoir is, has a way, we have a way of like, turning ourselves into heroes. That's right. Um, and I didn't want to do that. Um, I'm like, I can't, for instance, name my dad's issues without naming mine too. Mm -hmm. um, I was a horrible partner at some points, and my mom's looking at me, a horrible <laughs> sex partner at some point. Um, <laughs> and, I the children. Uh, okay. and I grew up, uh, you know, amongst a bunch of amazing women, sisters, aunts, who I know um, had to do so much more um, to like embrace their lives, to be who they are in ways that I just, you know, as, as men and boys, you, you know, we're allowed to stay out late. You know, we're trusted with, um, with, with sort of ownership and responsibility and all these other things. So part of what I wanted to do was to, to you know, hold myself accountable. I always say in this moment, it's so easy to point out, especially in a moment like this where Me Too is, is happening, the bad Negroes, the exceptional monsters, because it's like, you know, as long as I'm not that, ne I was about to say that, y'all good if I said that? <laughs> I'd say it sometimes, but as long as I'm not this dude over here, um, you know, I'm, a, I'm cool. Yeah. You know, I ain't sexually assault nobody. I'm not the one out here um, putting my hands on women. And for some reason, men, boys, think that that distancing from that person makes us, exonerates us from um, our, like, our need to, to examine ourselves. And I'm like, nah, like what we all need to do is sit down and, and say, okay, we are all complicit in this shit. Um, what monsters are lurking in me? Because we all got, they, they are there. Uh, I, and I, I do feel much more, compa I feel like once you write something down on paper like that, you damn sure need to hold yourself accountable to live in the thing that you're trying to preach. Yeah. So my words stand there as testimony to me, um, convicting me even when I fall short. Um, and I'm, I'm try every day I try to be a better human being. I try not to be a better man, I try to be a better human person. Um, I also think manhood and masculinity are too restrictive for any of us um, to be the full types of people we need now. to be. You see, you preach it. Um, thank you, Brittany. Thank you. Thank you so much. Y'all, get eloquent raids. But let me say something about Brittany, though. Brittany just did not, um, uh, you know, publish a trade press. She was also working on two other books. She is a, not only an amazing writer, um, somebody out here that loves her people, um, a commentator, but she's a fierce ass academic too, yes. with tenure. Okay. Yes. Look it up. So, first of all, <laughs> man, thank you for 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 this book. It, it's really a gift, and I don't know how many of you have read it yet, but it is really a gift. And I read it once when you sent it to me a while back, and then I reread it last night. And I was telling you before, you know, I was on the uh, train today, and I was like, yo, he ain't not going to have me crying on this Q train again. <laughs> like, <laughs> but there's, there's a way that you uh, depict um, the ordinariness of black life, where you talk about trauma, and you talk about pain, but you find a way to do that without compromising the beauty mm. that's in our life as well. Mm. Talk to me about your writing process. I mean, I'm watching you write about uh, these boys who assault you, and you still manage to note that these boys face was handsome <laughs> and it was important yeah right like you don't lose their humanity you write about your father his, his humanity is still there you write about people how, how do you do that as a writer and, and particularly keeping track of your own trauma um 
by looking crazy. <laughs> now, nah, actually, when I was writing, I, um, it was a hard, hard process for me. And I, I really did challenge myself to, because I didn't want the book to read like, here's some exceptional Negro that grew up in a hood. He was real smart. He made it out. Right. Be like him. Um, I, and I did not want to tell the story about my city, about my people that was only in, interested in, um, in sort of like, that was only about like black trauma. You know, I wanted to be honest. Yeah, we saw like, we saw things happening in our communities. We, we suffered, some of us suffered a lot. But even in the midst of that, love was present. Joy was present. Like, we danced. We smiled a lot. And I actually had to go back and look at pictures because I wanted to remember that in as much as trauma often um, creates these barriers that uh, disallows us from seeing the beauty in our lives, I smiled in the midst of a lot that was going on too. And I must say a big part of my lessons in love comes from my family. Like I come from a family who exemplify the best of radical black love. Like, you know that, that one aunt, our uncle that get on your, your last nerve? Oh yeah, I got three of them. You know, they might do some <laughs> shit, right? But we are the type of family that even that aunt or that uncle or that cousin or that stranger, really, even if they got on your nerves, the, um, nerves of the, la the day before, you won't let them be homeless. You're taking them in. In my family right here, they know we slept on floors yep. <laughs> with, 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 with strangers because even if they wronged us, we had a way of, of, of opening up space for them. And I wanted to embody that in the writing. I wanted to write a book that says, yeah, we can be real about all the shit that we faced, but the reason why we are alive today, the reason why I am alive is because of this people, because of these forces, um, some of the strength within ourselves, and black life in general. It's, it's really a nod at like, what it means to be black in this country. You know, yeah, we, you know, the, the title of the book is No Ashes in a Fire. And so much of that is about um, the, the reality that fires exist to literally take us out of here and actually does take some of us out of here. But yesterday I was talking to a pastor, of course he had like a Christian reference and he talked about Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, a bad Negro, um, <laughs> and how that they were still, they were, they were alive in a fire. Like black folk, are alive in the fire. It doesn't mean that we don't critique the fire, that we don't call it and name it, and that we don't hold people to account for setting fires, but we have found a way to be black as hell, to have black joy, to have black love, to, to create family, to live in spite of that shit. Um, so that's what I tried to do in the book, and that was really, really hard to try to strike that balance. I remember Bell Hooks was talking about, uh, in uh, Remembered Rapture, she talks about the challenge of writing memoir <laughs> when your parents still alive, when the family's still alive, when the people who harmed you or to whom you did harm are still alive. Yeah. Um, partly because you, you got to go back and show them that. They got to see that. <laughs> I know this is like day one, so some of this is going <laughs> unfold, but even in the process of writing that, how much of that was consideration? <laughs> oh, please. I was so scared. I was like, oh, God, this person going to fight me. <laughs> um, I'm going to get sued. <laughs> My mama going to think I'm a whore. Like... <laughs> She thinks I'm a whore. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I was like, oh. But it was so freeing, too, to be able, like, because, you know, I wanted to, you know, at some point, like, in writing this, I was like, you know what? I didn't let myself off the hook. And I tried to be as honest as possible. And something about being able to be courageous enough to put that on paper was so freeing for me. Because we hold so much shit in. Um, you know, I thought about all of the pain I held in that I had performed, I, I would walk through the world performing like with a smile on my face. People ask me how I'm doing, I'm good. Um, no one never really knew um, so much of what I was, and, and this I really, and I was thinking about young people, right? Like how can we teach them to practice vulnerability? So that when I ask you something like how you feeling today, y'all know the, where the church people at? I'm blessed and highly flavored, favored. No the hell you not. Now we not always blessed and highly favored. Some days I feel like taking myself out of here. And had I had access to that type of vulnerability between the ages of 14 and 28 when I was trying to kill myself, I could have spent 14 years doing some amazing shit. 
other than trying to think about what pill would have got me out of here. So in the book, I try to practice that. I want to, um, I, I try to be as honest as possible. And I did make decisions around what stories I would include and which ones I did not. Um, and there were a lot I didn't include. <laughs> Um, just because I wasn't ready to talk about them, I also didn't have conversations with people who I may have had to um, get consent for to include them. Um, I certainly had been very thoughtful about folk that I wrote about who passed away. Right. Um, so it was a hard process, but it was a beautiful one. It was the most beautiful thing I've ever done. Well, we are grateful for that process. This Again, this book is a gift, and I can't wait to see the world react to this because, as I said before, this book, will not just give insight into someone's life. I think it just might save someone's life. Thank you, Thank Mark. you. Thanks so much. <laughs> My brother, um, I always say, you know, there, we live, exist in a time where people want to be avatars, people want to be famous, insta-famous, um, and then there are people whose works actually are out in the world, like they're doing amazing things in the world that make, um, make them just real for us, uh, that makes them worth celebrating. And Mark is one of those people. He's used every gift he has and on behalf of black folk, and I appreciate him for that. When I met you some years ago, I just admired your everything. So it, it, it wasn't so shallow, but I felt like we were going to connect on a, on a level. And, you know, you, you were a style god. You are an Aquarius, and we, we share that. Um, <laughs> um, but you said something to me about who you see yourself as, and I think that's the, the piece in this. In addition to the activism, the piece that speaks to me most loudly in this piece is you as empath. You actually said to me, I am an empath. Now, I watched Darnell manage a group of young people who are writers and thinkers and who want to love folk and, and want to love themselves. But it was pretty radical to watch you do that in real time, in a real space, but then how it shows up in the book. I think everybody was, was speaking to that to some degree. I want to know how you manage to love so hard despite a burning rage. Mm. I want to speak to the honesty of the things that piss you off, that make you angry. I remember a recent incident <laughs> and a very well-known person and a very well-respected person um, said something that many of us felt was quite vile. And I observed you in those weeks be exactly what this book has highlighted about the importance of being black and free. There's a grace thing that you really embody. Um, and I just would like for you to speak to how to hold both the rage, like Sister Brittany speaks to, um, but also that empathy, that empathetic piece. There's something that you, you write in here that I just want folks to hear. Um, on July 13, 2008, I gave a speech at Newark's Gay Pride Ceremony. The weather was, a was typical of a summer day in Jersey, humid and hot. As I looked down at the attendees from the podium that mid-afternoon, I felt the spirited energy that would cruise through my body when I was at the pulpit. I looked down to find Keith in the crowd. He stood there with his back perfectly straight, staring back with an affirming glance. So this is you setting up to give this speech. When someone in the audience, I'm leaping ahead, says, shut the fuck up you fucking faggot. Darnell goes on to write. And I decided I could either leap off the stage and whoop his ass <laughs> or love the black man who had been taught to hate his reflection. I kept reading and I chose to love him, which is exactly what you did with that brother the other day when I was ready to take the earrings completely <laughs> off and meet you on any corner, anywhere. So just speak to where that comes from and the power of it mm. and how it ties to the idea of being both black and free. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that I had, by the time I finished the book, I was thinking so much about disposability. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that, like black people come to be in a country that before we have a chance to even 
name and, and, and be who we are in the world, um, we are already fit for what I call like extrajudicial liquidation. Um, it's why a police officer can see a 12 year old boy playing and see him as a terror um, worthy of not intervention, but what? Death. Yeah. So because we are so easily disposed of, like I really, fir and I'm like, you know, Aquarians, like if we theorize and preach a thing, like we try our best to practice it. And doing, I did that with my father. I did that with the young brother that tried to light me on fire. Like by the end of the book, I was not wanting him to be in jail. I literally was scavenging the internet to make sure that he was alive. Mm. Because I know what is awaiting the black person in this country any goddamn way, right? Like why, why send him to jail when the jails are the bohemians that's fucking our communities up? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm cussing a lot. But that's, t that's really messing our community up in the first place. Um, so I'm like, okay, how can we learn, how can I learn to not do to each other what the system does to us? And that to me is not just um, a poetic rhetorical question. Like that to me is a practice. Yeah. Um, and I try to embody that. Like I'm, I can't be up here, we can't be up, you can't write you know, about something that's called radical black love and then be totally fucking unloving. Like I just don't think that that's, the way that you, now I'm telling us a lot, because that doesn't mean that people who do wrong are not to be held account. And it don't mean that people are not out here doing bullshit. And it don't mean that I don't sometimes feel like karate chopping, I mean like right here, like right, <laughs> like I, I was in you, you, you know, well, I, was you, like, I was like, I just, go. I just don't want, just don't breathe for like 25 seconds and I'm gonna be good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but then I'm like, well, what is that, what is, how is that gonna fix? In the same way that jail was not gonna help OB to transform his mind such that he can't see me as a threat, <coughs> me chopping some brother in the neck ain't gonna help them to be less of an ass. I want to sometimes though. Um, so that's really what I try to practice. It's, you know, and then I'm old. That's another, you know, like that's another thing. Like I'm tired. You can't call somebody your big sister and <laughs> say, and I'm <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> but, <laughs> fine, like why? That's what you <laughs> Can I get one more in? Yes. Okay. Um, so you come out to your mother at 28. Yes. And you had been holding this thing inside for so long. And the day finally comes <laughs> and you tell her and she's like, what's news? <laughs> it made me think about all the times that we walk around thinking we're concealing something. Yeah and the whole world knows. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted you to talk to that <laughs> moment in time a little bit. And now that you've had so many years of reflection, help us understand. Why you gotta say so many? <laughs> <laughs> how, how, how the reflection now really, really feels when um, you can almost laugh at it. Yeah. You were filled with nerves and fears, and, but in reality, it was something that was a truth that was already in the ether, yeah. people who loved you understood it and it was time for you to kind of understand it on your own terms. So looking back, um, how does that time feel and just help liberate us some more, get us freer <laughs> in terms of speaking our own truths in real time? Yeah, it was so, um, I was so scared. Um, and it's so funny because now I have my other sister who isn't here, Tasha. Oh, well she's on FaceTime. Um, <laughs> Hi Tasha. <laughs> Hi Tasha, we love you. She was like, uh, I, I was explaining to her, she was like, she was reading, I had, was giving her chapters, and she, um, she started laughing. She was like, bro, I wasn't gonna tell you this, but you know, I found some of your letters years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and we read them. <laughs> so I don't know what you thought you was hiding, but or whatever, you wasn't hiding shit, you know what I'm saying? Um, <laughs> but it made me think about how long I had carried the burden. Yes. Um, that weight completely weighed me down, that really made me depressed, when there was folk right um, in earshot of me who was ready to love me into myself. And so often the fear of rejection. Yeah. And I really, like, I, I mean, like, I say this, like, I am talking about a black ass family from Camden, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And so many times we think black folk are sort of not progressive, they can't, you know, they're not like, 
with it. And these folk are just totally, you know, they taught me like really what it means to love. And the day my mom looked at me and said, I love you, you are my son, I swear to you, like every weight drop. I wrote in a book, like, and I really didn't mean this. Like, I wanted to get a shirt, like, I'm gay as hell, and I don't care, because my mama love me. Like, what you going to watch out? You know what I mean? And like, and it just makes me think how many of our young people, if they had someone who can mirror for them, like a reflect, like can say to them, like, I see you and I love you, how many of them would not be on the streets right now? How many of them, you know, I think about my sexual practices and so much of what I did was about trying to um, be in the arms of people, strangers sometimes, who could affirm me when I was really looking for that from, from the people in my life. Um, so it was freeing. And, and just I'll end here and say that it was a moment that helped me to realize that coming out is not what we do. Coming out is all about making sure that those outside of ourselves are comfortable by naming ourselves as different. I say inviting in. It's an act of hospitality. I own the right to my house, my body, my life. I claim and make space for people that I feel safe enough to disclose to and I don't have to come out of shit. I ain't hiding this shit. Um, the only closet, the only thing that needs to be demolished is this sort of idea that folk who are not straight ought to perform for straight folk and make y'all feel comfortable about some shit. Like, I don't gotta make you feel comfortable about nothing. You know what I mean? Um, and my family taught me that. So, thank you. Thank you. I love you so much. I love you, Darnell, and I'm so inspired. I'm so inspired. Congratulations. Mom, um, I just wanted to make sure that I say publicly before all of these folk here how much I adore you, um, how much I love you, and thank you so much for literally saving my life. Um, this, the writing of this book had so much to do with your example, so much to do with your strength and courage. And when I think about sheroes and heroes, people who have defied odds, you always come to my mind. Um, I can go down a list of things that you've done um, that have inspired me. And you often say I inspire you, um, but you've inspired me, so thank you. I tell you this privately, but thank you before all of the people here. I love you so much, and I'm love so, so proud of you. Um, how did you feel when you... <laughs> When you, what was your reactions when you were reading the <laughs> manuscripts? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I started reading, I got to some parts, I was like, why you say that? I, you know, but I was in shock. Yeah. I, I really wasn't. Yeah. Some parts I did close my eyes, I said, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I had to take a break. <laughs> I said, I'll come back to that tomorrow. <laughs> But that's before I got the book. So I, I was on my phone. Usually I'm playing games. So I was like, oh no. I said, I'll come back tomorrow. <laughs> but um, I, it wasn't too shocking. Yeah. It really wasn't. I, I appreciate, um, one of the things that you model for us is, you know, you draw from your own life experiences and I think that makes you really humble and able to accept um, folk. Um, wherever they are, however they yes. come to you. Yes. Um, what was it like reading your life story on paper? Um, some parts was hurtful, and then some parts was, dang, I put up with all this. Being the woman I am today, mm -hmm. I don't know if I would have put up with all that. But I did it mainly for the, you and the girls. So I put up a lot with what I went through because of my children. But today, uh -uh. <laughs> I'm a new me. <laughs> a new me. You, um, you know, I, um, one of the things you said to me that I was so moved by is how in reading the book and in reading those stories, you had sort of blocked out so much. like. Yes. You didn't remember a lot. And I didn't. And when you read it. It, it brought back memories. I, that, that's why I said I was like, whew. 
That's why I was like, dang, I put up with all this. That's why I said that. Yeah. I, I, I didn't remember half of that stuff. I was like, dang, how do I not remember all this? Because I blocked everything out. And that rain, it did bring back a whole lot. And, and by it being on the surface, um, and that's one of the things that a writer, you know, writing this, I'm always thinking, not only its impact on me, right, but its impact on those with, on whom, who's on behalf of whom I'm writing as well, right? right? So what happens when those things come to the surface? How, does, how do you, was it easy to massage and sort of move on? Um, is it easy to forget um, or heal from? Um, was it a challenge for you? I, I was interested in knowing that. It was, and um, the healing part comes from, like you, you forgive a lot and love more. Mm. And that's where we are like at. Mm. Like so many things happen to me, but I'm not gonna go out there and kill you. You might have back in the day though. <laughs> no, probably now. <laughs> 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 no, that's a joke. <laughs> no, sometimes, yeah, I felt like it. But um, it, it took a lot to heal. What? And some parts, some places in my life, I'm still not healed. Yeah. What are you, were you, were you nervous to think, after reading what I wrote, were you nervous about how people might respond to me um, in the world? Like, one of the things, like, she, she called me up, she was like, I hope you change some of the names in here. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how does it make you feel? I, because I'm I'm vulnerable. I right? mean, I I one I was proud of before writing it because I'm like, you know what? He probably would feel a whole lot better. Like you said, a big load off of you. But then I was like, dang, I hope they somebody else's names because they gonna try to sue Darnell <laughs> and everything. So that's the first thing that came to my mind. Like, I as a mother, you always gonna feel harm for your child, you don't want no harm coming yeah. to him. So that's the first time where I said, oh, I hope he ain't using nobody's name. <laughs> he said, well, some people, I'm a, but I, 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 I know who the majority of them are. <laughs> Y'all caught <laughs> so, that, right? <laughs> so all the fake names, I still know. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, if you had to write a book, what would your story be about? my life what, what were some, what would be like some of the big key moments for you my life um the big key moments would be um how I survived through being a young teenage mother and um actually growing up in the world <laughs> and sometimes I say to myself my story might help young teenage adults mm -hmm. like girls teenage girls and on females period mm -hmm. you know my mom um she was 16 when i was born and when i think about all that i was able to do at 16 um and how you literally stopped and, and maybe didn't even pursue so many of your dreams to raise your kids. I went off and got three degrees before, and, and you gave space to us. And this is something that I'm, I'm always thinking about mamas and the sacrifices y'all make, the labor that we don't honor you for, and how you allowed me to go into this world and get three degrees before you got your high school diploma. Mm -hmm. It brings me to say. Um, so I just want to just, you know, thank you. My mom is not like the public speaker. No. Um, she and my, my pops is over here. My stepfather, Lee, raise your hand. He said, we prayed before she got up there on the stage. <laughs> um, thank you so much for, for being a stellar example, a stellar example of a fighter, of a black woman who taught me everything I know about what it means to survive in the world. Thanks so much. Love you. Love you too. Um, I want to just take a moment to thank the Nathan Cummins Foundation and Critical Minded for making this possible today.
a big part of the work of Critical Minded is um, really exemplifying the importance and the role of critics of color. So I have two questions that I want to ask our panel to sort of respond to, just two, and then we're going to open up the floor for questions from you all. And now I get to ask the questions, and y'all get to answer them. All right, the first one. I agree to this. The first one is um, really general. Let's talk about the power of black literature in this moment, right now. Why is it important for so many um, brilliant black books to be coming out now um, and, and the work that they can do in the world? So say a little bit about that. Um, I think one thing is the there's, there's something to be said. First of all, there's so much good stuff coming out, yeah. right? I mean. Your book came out a few months ago, Eloquent Rage, and it was is magnificent. You all really yes. should, should read it. And your book, my, my, my book is cool, but but <laughs> but but I think what's interesting about what y'all are doing is, and it, it's brilliant cultural criticism, and it's memoir, and it's analysis, and it's self critique, and it's it's this just disclosure on so many levels that I think changes the game for us. So I think it's important to have that. I think a lot of times we wait until it's too long, mm -hmm. until it's too late because we see memoir as a, as a, a self-indulgent thing. And so everybody waits. And as black folk, we're not guaranteed to be here. Right. I mean, wouldn't you want a memoir from Tony K. Bambara right now? Wouldn't you want a memoir from, from, from yes. Zora Neale Hurston right now? And you know, Mara uh, is amazing too, don't get me wrong, but I'm talking about like some kind of a memoir. You know, so many of us don't get to live that long. And, and so I think it's powerful to see our lives and in the, in, in the interior layers of our lives right now in the moment. And I think the, this will help us make sense of this amazing time we're in. We are in a historical moment that we're gonna look back on with wonder and to watch y'all produce literature that will help us make sense of that moment on its own terms, I think is amazing and I think, I think it's necessary. Um, you know, the thing um, that I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about two things. Um, one of the threads of our conversations both before we came upstairs and also here um, in community and conversation has been about vulnerability. Mm -hmm. um, and I studied black memoir from the 19, pretty much from the first moment that black folks could write memoir. Um, it's one of the things that I work on. And the thing that I'm struck by is the way that in earlier memoir, in periods of memoir, black folks didn't feel the vulnerability to talk about struggle, to talk very openly about relationships, to talk really openly about the things they didn't get right. So very often these memoirs were political and they were meant for white people. Mm -hmm. They were meant to sort of give the best version of black life to white people and to prove our humanity. And it is really nice to live in a moment where the goal of the memoir is not to say to white people, we are human, but to say to black folks, we all right. Mm -hmm. And you ain't crazy. Yeah. And I see you and you matter. And also to say that the goal is not to achieve some notion of respectability. The, you know, not to prove like, well look, we the kind of exceptional Negroes that get to write books, but to really say, we're very regular people, right, who've had some extraordinary opportunities, but that we wouldn't be these folks but for the very regular people who gave us the tools to navigate yes. this moment. That's a really important story to tell. Um, the other thing that I think, that I find interesting you know, there are all these sort of waves of memoir that happen. Um, and so it feels really cool to sort of be in the next, you know, I've, I've been wondering like, when's the next wave gonna come? I didn't anticipate being a part of it. <laughs> um, but it's cool because we're also in a moment though where, where young folks still care a lot about curation. They care about it in a, in a huge way where everyone has a platform and we're hyper visual. And so people are picking and choosing who they are for others to see and for public consumption. And in that moment, that can give you another veneer of invulnerability too. Um, and there is also a way that because of social media, which I spend a lot of time on and overshare on and all of that, um, that sometimes people can pimp mm -hmm. their trauma and pain for clicks and views. And what I so value about your work is that I never felt like you sensationalized your story. I never felt like you pimped folks just so people would listen to what you had to say. And I think it's actually really important in this moment where now so many of our folks actually do have a moment to be heard, that we understand that part of what it means to care about black life is not to sanitize the story, 
but not to pimp the story either right. for other folk. Not to not to lay all your stuff bare before you've done the work to heal it. Not to, you know, that when we tell the story, you gotta dig deep and do the work. And so I love that you talk about the way that the book transformed you. I still feel messed up. My book just came out and I'm like, Lord, let me go to this therapist, <laughs> get this acupuncture, all the things. <laughs> Because, because if you really, really are trying to do the work, then it actually isn't for everybody else. It is ultimately so that you can be transformed. And in the process, you invite in folks for the work of transformation. Yeah. And Brittany be acting like she's not a preacher. Yes. <laughs> I'll just still fight you. I'll just, <laughs> uh, just um, my thought as Brittany was speaking, um, one, having not authored a book. Um, but really, but, but midwife. So but midwife, which is an important role. Yes. But I have to say that I think for a new generation of um, black intellectuals, and by intellectuals, I, I don't necessarily mean um, academic. I mean the, the quest for information, the, the thirst and desire to understand self, the world around you, just the quench for more. Um, to have public intellectuals, to have, there was a time where we weren't in conversation with our PhDs, we weren't in conversation with our authors, and um, these folk on the stage right now are They've been vulnerable for themselves, but they've been vulnerable for us, and it allows us to not just get caught up in character count or post. There is, for those of us who quench for more, a place to go now, and it's so highly relatable. So for me, the work that you've done, really the work that all of you do all the time, but the, the written work, um, it's rigorous, it's responsible, it's... Um, authentic. I mean, the things that we hold dear as those values that a lot of us older heads complain about them drifting and going away from the culture and not being centered. Here is a place where you can bring your young self, you can bring your colloquialisms, you can bring whatever it is that makes you feel like the powerful millennial you are and feel heard, seen, um, and, and, and reflected. So I just, I think it's an important time the memoir wave that you're in now, um, Darnell, but also your example as a person in the LGBT community who is being so brave um, and so real and so forgiving. You forgive awkwardness, you forgive bad questions, you forgive <laughs> stupidity, you forgive <laughs> anger and vent. I've just seen you like be graceful around it all and the book does the same thing. So. Um, you, you've got to treat yourself to this. And if you are younger than 25 years old, you must know these three people on the stage. It will change how you see yourself in the world. That's what I have to share. Let's talk about the role of the critic, but not just the critic, but critics of color. Why are critics of color, if black literature is always necessary? and necessary at this moment and will always be necessary. Um, not just for black folk, but I think for it is <laughs> for this country's sake. Um, why then is the role of the cultural critic, the black cultural critic, the Latinx cultural critic, um, you know, the black queer or trans cultural critic, why are they, why are they critical right now? You know, um, and always. And always. Um, they keep us honest. Um, we're in a moment where we have access to platforms to, to tell the truth and to push um, and to dig deeper. Um, and, you know, I mean, we're seeing, thankfully, the decline of the American empire. Um, you gotta say it. Yeah. We, look, we know that the American empire ain't served nobody in this room. Come on, you okay, <laughs> get free. It hasn't, and so I know that it's scary to watch white men bash it to pieces with bats and anger. I understand that that's not comfortable, right? Um, but the, <laughs> I understand that. But, I, but, the dis, but the dismantling 
as much as uncomfortable as it makes me, the thing about critics is, and look, and, and, and what I actually want to say is, I find critics hard. Mm. I, I am a critic sometimes, but I find the critical posture a hard posture. Because I always want to see the good, what we building, what we doing, what, where we going. I'm an optimist. And the critic is always like, this is where we fucked up. This is where we ain't got it. This you on BS. Like you not, you know, dig deeper, go deeper. And so, but here's the thing. But the, when those folks are centered and clear and work and move with integrity, they're actually the foundation for whatever we want to build. They're the folks who say we can be better. We can do this better. We can have more. We can push farther. We can dream bigger. That's what good criticism does. And what I hope in this moment when I get the opportunity to tra train critics and when I think about what it means to, to be a critic, and I, again, I feel some tension around that term, mm. but when I, because critical is one thing, but just like endless criticism is another thing, right? right. Um, and, and so what my charge to us who are in that work is what are we building, yes. not what are we tearing down, what does it look like to get it right? Because we're all very clear about how, what it looks like to get it wrong. Right? Yeah. Thank you for that. I, I think um, I think the black cultural critic, um, and I agree with everything Brittany said. I, I, I think they keep us honest. I think they keep us true. I think they challenge us to do and be better. And I think the black cultural critic at her best is also somebody who is um, drawing from different traditions. Mm -hmm drawing from our resources, our cultural reservoir, to yield a different type of analysis. If, if you assess hip hop, and Karen can speak to this more than we can, she's talking about not writing the book, Karen is, I mean, literally one of the most significant figures in hip hop, not just hip hop journalism, but hip hop yes. history. And we really need to appreciate, yes. and, and that's a story that needs to be told as well. Um, but imagine if we only assess hip hop through a Western, European, say even rock lens, we would miss on so much, right? When people celebrate Eminem for his use of iambic pentameter, he can write like Shakespeare, <laughs> you know. Still. That's cool, but, but then you miss why Black Thought is so much better. Yeah. yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, if I'm listening to jazz and I'm only listening to it in a certain way, I don't understand what the pocket is. Right. Because we, they don't have a vocabulary that can accommodate how we function in the world. And so part of what the black critic does is they bring new stuff to the table. They bring new tools, new units of measurement, new units of, new units of analysis so that they can understand what we're doing on its own terms as opposed to trying to match up to someone else's terms. And the, the, the other thing, though, is, again, that's at our best. Right. We have to be at our best. Not, not for anybody else's sake, but for our own, because I'm, I, I'm often reading criticism that is self-indulgent, that is mean, and, and, and there's just cr being critical and being mean are two different things. And I read criticism or critiques from some very prominent people, sometimes it's just mean. Yeah. And sometimes it's not advancing an argument. Sometimes it's not advancing an agenda. Sometimes it's not advancing a politics. Sometimes it's not advancing the building of an institution. It's only serving to be mean. Yeah. Or, or, or to pull somebody down because they have something that you wish you had. And, and I'm not signifying on anybody, I'm not talking about myself, I'm talking about I'm watching people critique other folk, and sometimes it's just, it becomes a, a critique industry, where it's the business of critiquing folk. And, you know, I like a good think piece every once in a while, but I'm like, sometimes I hate when stuff happens. Right. Because it's like, I don't want to read 15 Pusha T. <laughs> I just want to, I just want to do memes and laugh, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, I don't need the 15 Pusha T think pieces. Like, let's just enjoy this moment. And so I think we have to find a way to do that. Anyway, yeah. And it, it's, nice, it's nice to have the critic um, before you, because just as you experienced, I think that the thing that critics um, at their best, black cultural critics, synthesize. So we get to have all of our parts there. We, we talk about intersectionality all the time, and the, the cultural critic who really is on her game or on his game helps you recognize all of those very small parts all at once. You've yeah. watched television and been throwing things at it, and then Mark shows up, and you're like, ah, 
finally, the thing that I needed to have said about hip hop gets said in the context of the political conversation. Finally, the thing that needs to be said about black women's style gets spoken to in the context about the conversation about politics, once again. It's, so it's the idea that we can synthesize and that finally, like in this modern context, we're gonna use all of the tools, we're gonna talk about all of our parts, we're gonna heal all of our flaws one by one because we're gonna announce them. Cultural critics, I think, when they're really at their best, help us see those broken, broken things. They ignore the white lens. I'm talking about black cultural critics and cultural critics of color. They center their folk, right? We are at center. Do y'all, I want, yeah. Um, I was gonna do this old school. Look who's here, Punchinella, punch it. who's old in here? <laughs> like there's this thing where you put the black girl in the middle and everybody circles around her. But anyway, the, the cultural critic, the black cultural critic today that's really on his or her game remembers all of our parts and is trying to speak to each of those things with honesty and clarity and without performance for white folks. And, and that is black and free and that is what Darnell <laughs> is. So, thank you. Aren't they dope? Like, for real. Um, we want to open up the floor to uh, a few questions. So I do believe there are microphones. Molly has a microphone. And then Lucy has a microphone. Uh, oh, the lights are on. Um, anyone have any questions? That might, please raise your hand if you can and tell something. Hi. So, I mean, I hear and agree with everything that you are saying about cultural critics, but I've always felt like the role, the cause of intersectionality demands the work of the griot, who is not a critic. Um, it's the person who, you know, who goes and travels and catalogs so many, these different lives, these things that people haven't seen. A lot of us even have not seen the full diversity of intersectional lives that are our people. So at this moment, where criticism is particularly salient, like, what advice would you give, and how can you reinforce those people who are committed to doing the work of the griot specifically, of just getting the story? Um, I'm gonna, we have, a, we have historians up here. <laughs> griots, you wanna? <laughs> are we griots? <laughs> oh Lord. Um, look, I, like I said, I, I'm ambivalent, of, precisely for the, the reasons that Mark mentioned, you know, the sort of meanness of think piece culture and the think piece industry. Um, and so I'm very much focus on, focused on what, what can we create. Um, and so what I would challenge folks to do is think about what does your practice, be that the practice of the griot, the practice of the critic, the practice of the editor, the writer, the artist, what does it make possible? What is the thing that you are trying to open up the space for? Are you just here to break shit? Or are you here to build shit? Um, and I say that when we, we know that a world is being broken. So when I said a moment ago that the, the American empire is declining and we're watching white men smash it with bats because they don't have, they're fools and they don't see that, I mean, that they ruin in their own shit, that's fine. Um, <laughs> you know, part of what I've... can't play with it when they're Well, I think we can because, I, because you're never gonna, black people always play. I mean, you, you get hip hop out of the rubble of the industrialization. We all we always, you know, we, we just look at it and say, well, what's possible? And that's why, but that is why the black critic is so important. Don't ever think that critique is not at the heart of creation, right? That, you know, that there's that it, you know, when we think about hip hop, that they're right at the heart of that system is a like, oh, they have us with all of this lack and all of these things that we can't have, but we still gonna build some shit. We still gonna make some shit. We will be undeterred from that. And I think that we gotta be undeterred. Um, but I also want to say, too, because um, I was thinking as Kierna was talking about one of my most favorite moments when you were the editor-in-chief of Ebony was the Cosby cover. Say that again, the editor-in-chief. She was the editor-in-chief of Ebony magazine, right? Um, and, 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 and perhaps the most progressive editor, and I know they've had some dope folk at the helm of that magazine, but who really shifted what kinds of black life got represented in that space. And so she's sitting here being humble, but it's very important to say the courage that you had in, yes. in shifting a black yeah. institution that folks thought was on one particular path. So a couple of years back when the Cosby scandal first broke, 
they put out this cover with the you know iconic picture of the Cosby family from the show, you know, with a smash in a smashed frame. And I know it was controversial, and everybody had all the feelings, all of them. right? But that that kind of courage, right, to, to to not center whiteness and to have the conversation that we needed to have in community is the thing we're talking about. So it doesn't mean don't it doesn't mean be pretty all the time. It doesn't mean blow smoke and and don't say what's true. But it does mean that there's a, a courage and a care. Because even in that smashed image, there was a, an attention to the sense of what we lost in the reckoning with Cosby's violence. And that's the kind of work that I think critics do in whatever arena. And so when you are an actual cultural critic, that's how it shows up. It's not just in the think piece, but what do you do to make the culture see itself and think differently and think about what is possible? Thank you. Other questions? And they made me take off my earrings, and now. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Hi. Um, my name is Monique. I'm actually Dayon's mother. How you doing? Hi here. Hey. <laughs> um, so I just had a question. I love your story. Um, Dan did share some of the book with me. I didn't get to read it too much more. But I work with a lot of young people um, in the bed area, uh, after school program, things like that. What are you doing to, or what are you willing to do to kind of uh, come out and kind of tell your story a little more and kind of, because I see so many different lifestyles coming into my center. So many kids from different broken homes, things like that. What are you doing or willing to do to come out and kind of meet those needs and help some of those kids maybe develop and open up and be courageous and you know begin to fight? Yeah, so one of the first things I decided to do immediately is to invite um, people to this event who do that work every day. Um, so right there in the third row, Lillian, raise your hand. Lillian <laughs> is the Director of Advocacy and Capacity Building for Hetrick Martin Institute. Uh. It's the nation's largest and oldest LGBTQ youth servant organization where I was once the director of educational initiatives. Lillian has a staff and part of a team that is in New York doing this work every single day. And they've been doing it for more than 35 years. So my encouragement would be for anyone that's in this room who is working with young people, get you a piece of Lillian. <laughs> my first job that I ever had was that of a teacher. The job I had after that, I was trained as an adolescent psychotherapist. Among those folk that I was working with, what I came to understand that the children were never the problem, but it was the people who told me that their job was to teach kids, to go in here and give therapy to kids. And you know I once gave a, a, a training to 300 teachers in Newark, New Jersey. A good number of them told me that because of their religious beliefs, that they would be unable to adequately teach some of their students who identified as LGBTQ. That's just oh. one example. So. Lillian's work is about getting with those teachers who believe that education is only possible when we educate some, and helping them to understand why it's important to educate all. Um, and anybody that here needs assistance, see Lillian when you get out of here. Yeah. <laughs> there she go, right there. <laughs> Anybody got other questions? Hi, Darnell. Oh, hey. <laughs> so the work that all of you are doing is incredible, but it's long work. It's work for a lifetime. So my question is, how do you choose when what you're doing requires some degree of bravery and putting yourself out there and being vulnerable? How do you decide when you need to be brave mm. and when you need to pull back and take care of yourself for a little while? You want to? Um, yeah, I mean, this is, I kind of feel like I'm personally in the thick of that question right now, but I'll tell you about Darnell's example. Um, <laughs> when Darnell came she be, she be to, straight work, the time. <laughs> to work with me um, at, a, at a company called Interactive One, now known as I1 Digital, where we're working on an incredible documentary. Stay tuned. Um, he showed up as someone who knew his worth. He knew that we needed him. He knew that we wanted him. And he said, I'm gonna need a month, about a month into this thing we're doing, where I cut out. 
I am finishing my book. I am healing myself. My father passed away a year ago and I need to come to conclusion before I make a full commitment to you. Are we clear? We shook hands and we were clear. So I think that the art of remembering that it's okay to let the people around you who ask of you know that this is my time. Now, how to navigate when that should be, I, I think that's just gonna be a personal call for everyone. I know for me, I've been working for 25 years um, since the day I walked out of Hampton University and became an editor at The Source magazine. Um, and I have, as has been spoken to, helped a lot of careers happen. I've helped a lot of words hit the page and a lot of images hit the page that I hope speak to um, the love and devotion I have for our people. Um, and that I want to be a reflection of how I see myself. But I had to actually step away from a corporate entity to remember that I'm a writer, to remember that I'm a mother, to remember that the other parts of me, I always talk about the parts, um, to get through Britney's book that had been sitting on my desk for three months. I mean, there are things that I needed to do. Um, and so I just kind of took a deep breath and said, this is, if not now, when? Um, and so here I am jobless, but before you and very happy. Um, so, you know, I think everybody says, I'm gonna feel brave on a Thursday and maybe I'm a little more vulnerable on Friday. I think the art is being able to say on Friday to the people who are asking of you, today's not the day I need to take care of self. Yes, yeah. I'm so, I'm just, I'm so amped about what life is about to open up for you. Oh, thank you. Um, all that you're about to create, it's about to be all the things. Yes. Hello, everyone. Hello. My name is Ashley. And I want to say thank you so much, Donna, for being brave enough to come up and to share your story with all of us. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And also for the panel, for your hard work, I want to say thank you as well. You're welcome. I want to let you know for myself, as, as being a black deaf person in the community, wow. This has really been amazing. But I want to ask you a question as it relates to the advice that you have for us in our community as writers, for us to be able to express ourselves. How did you do it, and how can we do it? Wow. <laughs> um, ooh. I was so scared to write a book. Um, I was scared because I knew that once I committed, I feared um, failing myself. Um, so that was one. Two, um, when you exist in communities that are themselves existing on the edges of the margins, furthest away, the furthest away from people's care and concern, um, communities that are, that are not often sort of the first places we go um, to pull writers from, communities whose stories are not represented. So to be clear, like when I was in K-12, to I didn't read stories um, about people whose experiences were close to mine. Um, so I, can't, I can only imagine, right, how um, one's ability or different ability can also be a determining factor in how, or how their story gets told or not. Um, that being said, I don't know. You know what I decided? I was just like, I'm gonna do this shit. The first thing, or the first person I'm gonna write for is me. Yes. I have to know that I am a writer. Yes. And I literally said those words. And I never, it took me a long time to say that because it used to sound real whack. <laughs> but I said, I'm a writer. And the moment I start believing that, and the moment I you know, started relying on other people to affirm for me the truth I know about myself was the moment that I could finally put words to paper and fall in love with them. So you're a writer, and I can tell you that. Tell yourself and believe it, and write what you need to write. Create what you need to create. And I'm telling you, when you do that from your heart and you do it guided by the spirit, the universe has a way of finding the audiences that your, your words need to fall on behalf of. You know, and I'll say this and I'll end. You know, there are people who were like, 
they, they write with the intent to make a bestseller. I swear to you, when I was writing, the only person I could see in the audience in my head was a little 16-year-old little black nerdy boy with big glasses, a 16-year version of me. And all I kept thinking is, I may not make a bestseller list. I may not get good, you know, good critical responses. But if a 16-year-old boy, the boy that I was, pick up my words and find something in it that can cause him to live and see himself as worthy, then I did my damn job. Any other questions? Cool. Um, thank you all so much um, for this, just for being here. Can I say something real quick? Yes. This book is amazing. I know y'all are going to go buy a copy, but the way you can support Darnell is to not just buy one copy yeah. tonight, but to buy a copy as a gift tonight. So you have a friend that you know needs this book. You have a cousin, a son, a nephew, a next door neighbor, somebody in your school that needs this book. Go out there and support this book. These books only get made when we buy them and support them. Yes. So please pick up two or three copies tonight as your contribution to the movement. <laughs> he got plenty. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. I want to say thank you to y'all. <laughs> so we are going to be signing books outside, uh, downstairs, but thank you so much. There are people here. I'm so many people I need to thank, but I. I like this whole row, right? Like this is this is y'all. Yeah. I don't want to miss anybody, so I'm not going to. Do, but my family, my my friends, thank you so much for making this possible. It is because of you I was able to get this done. Um, to Nation, to Nation Books, uh, my publishing team, my ed my editor Katie is here. Raise your hand, Katie. Help me to make beautiful work. To Christina, my publicist. Um, to Jeremiah and Jen Cox, um, the folk who have been managing this, all of the folk at the nation who has gone out and made this book possible. I mean, they went out and really sold this um, because they loved it. Um, thank y'all. Thank you for being here. And thank BAM for hosting this and Nathan Cummins for making it possible. See y'all downstairs.